So here is another favorite topic of mine. Um, after we've talked about these, especially the surface winds of the feral cell, excuse me, the surface winds of the Hadley cell, being the easterly trades, the surface winds of the um, the feral cell being those mid-latitude westerlies, and the surface winds associated with the polar cell being those polar easterlies. Now we can actually talk about ocean currents, okay? Because it's the, the, the oceans, the large bodies of water, um, in and of themselves, that fluid, does, the, the liquid water, wouldn't necessarily have these large ocean current, currents that we're familiar with. And the currents actually um, are pushed by the prevailing winds. And uh, I just think that is so cool. And the way the 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 global winds, um, and so actually, if you're kind of a visual person, here is my oceans. Here are my oceans, and here's the wind above it. And so, um, due to a bit of friction, the force of friction. Um, actually, remember frictional forces go. Um, but anyway, it's a rubbing sort of thing these frictionally kind of contact, the winds contact the oceans and they drag the oceans in the direction of the prevailing wind. Isn't that so cool? So then, um, the, to me then, the reality is, is as you go down in, I'm going down now, descending down into the, the bottom of the ocean, at some point you don't have any, um, you don't have any ocean current because the ocean current starts up here and it get, actually we can kind of think of each layer of ocean kind of affecting the layer of the ocean below it and it, and it creates, actually there's a twist called the Eichmann spiral that I'm not going to necessarily emphasize this semester that kind of occurs as, as, the, um, as you go down the ocean. My point here was going to be as you get down the bottom of the ocean there's basically no current. So um, we're going to talk about global winds, and we're going to talk about kind of these ocean currents associated with these global winds. And the global winds, of course, are associated with the, the, the three-cell model of, of, our, of our winds on a global scale. So I'm going to count on you to remember a few things. The semi-permanent high pressure that is be, between the Hadley and the Feral cells. Okay, you're going to see that in a minute. And actually, maybe to a, a lesser extent, we're going to see that um, that uh, I think it's called a semi-permanent low, uh, polar low. That's between the Feral and the Polar cell. Um, so let's take a look at some figures. So I guess uh, you're going to have to look back in my lectures for where I talk about surface winds, um, kind of the prevailing global surface winds. But if you do, what you're going to find out are these, uh, now they will change these ocean currents, not as much as the winds, but they do move, I believe, slightly seasonally as these um, as our intertropical convergence zone moves and all the cells kind of move seasonally. But here are the five ocean gyres. And ocean gyres are made up of, let's see if I can go ahead and kind of focus in. Um, an ocean gyre is made up of a, uh, but a, a combination of currents. So for instance, here we have the North Atlantic Ocean Gyre. And notice that we have these currents that kind of connect up. We have the Gulf Stream Current, the North Atlantic Drift, the Canary Current. And it's kind of cool because, and I think I've talked about this earlier, the blue means that the Canary Current, for instance, is coming from the pole towards the equator, so it's a cool current. And we have the North Equatorial Current kind of finishing that overall ocean gyre. So, um, and I guess to me you're going to have to kind of go back in my lectures and kind of see but what we the reason we have this ocean gyre here uh, and this is getting a little bit messy let me choose a different color let's choose red um, is because we have a semi-permanent high pressure here and it, it, it kind of migrates uh, north in July and south in January but the semi-permanent high pressure here, notice that we, around a high, we gen generally will have clockwise motion, and that's what you see this gyre moving, and the direction you see this gyre moving. And um, that high, well, I started to say I lost that thought, <laughs> what that high is is between the Hadley and the Feral cell. So let me kind of zoom out a little bit. 
Okay, so that's one ocean gyre. Let's count our five ocean gyres. Um, let's see. Let's stick with the northern hemisphere. We have a second ocean gyre here, um, and it's the North Pacific. And you can kind of see that the North Pacific on this figure is continued over here into um, this ocean basin over here. In the southern hemisphere, we have three major um, ocean gyres, and they would be this Indian Ocean gyre, we have the South Atlantic um, gyre, and we have ocean gyre. I like that word. And then here we have the South Pacific Ocean gyre, which on this figure kind of continues um, over here. So I don't know. Maybe you're not as impressed as I am, but I, I just think that is so cool that those large ocean currents are associated with the prevailing winds generally that are in that neck of the woods. So just I guess to finish that thought let me change to the red color. We have another semi-permanent high here, a semi-permanent high here, and you can kind of see um, this would be our doldrums. Remember we kind of have here at the intertropical convergence zone um, kind of for prevailing wind called the doldrums. Now not much is made of, of, of it here, but this would be one of our semi-permanent lows, a nice semi-permanent low down here. And actually, if you look, we do have, going around um, this little uh, body of water up here, we do have a counterclockwise movement, kind of showing you that would be a low. So related to oceans and ocean currents, I'm going to talk about something called, an important phenomenon called upwelling. And actually, oh, how'd that do that? And actually, um, upwelling, I'm kind of getting us ready to talk about the last topic in this chapter, which is something called El Nino La Nina. And it kind of, it's something we've all heard of. What is, it's an El Nino, that sounds exciting, or a La Nina, that sounds exciting. And we're going to see that actually, Worldwide speaking, we kind of go back and forth between these two conditions. But one way to identify these conditions has to do with actually the amount of upwelling. And so I need to talk about upwelling. And when I think of upwelling, I think of, I'll just kind of try to make a, well, let me make a, go on to another piece of paper. So let's try this. I brought up a new piece of paper to kind of talk about upwelling. Um, and so upwelling is important um, a way, like I think I mentioned a minute ago, to identify whether we are in an El Nino or La Nina cycle. And in order for upwelling to, uh, to, to be active, we need to have um, all sorts of a significant amount of wind in the right direction above this. This is my large body of water. This is my ocean. And so as I've drawn this, this would be the bottom of the ocean, and this is actually kind of slamming against, or the water can intersect or slam it. This is the coast over here, isn't it? Um, so what upwelling depends upon, or what upwelling is, is basically um, cold water, which I bet you buy that. Down here in the bottom of the ocean, we have, generally speaking, cold water. Cold water coming up, that's upwelling. Okay, and in normal conditions, um, a lot of coasts are blessed with having this cold water come up. Now, not only is it cold water, so so if you're on the on the coast, you ge you generally feel cooler, okay, with upwelling in place. But nice, healthy upwelling will bring. Um, uh, we have all sorts of. Uh, I'll go ahead and write in the word nutrients because I think that's what's on the slide. We have all sorts of microorganisms that that thrive down here in the bottoms of the ocean. So, upwelling brings cold water and nutrients up to the coast. I'm going to put a little smiley face here. So upwelling is a good thing. And under normal conditions, and I'm going to kind of show you what abnormal conditions is in the next series, uh, video segment when I talk about El Nino and La Nina. Under normal conditions, upwelling makes everybody happy. So just kind of remember that. So I'm a little bit apologetic. Let me go ahead and you guys who are kind of filling in the blanks, your PowerPoint slides, kind of look up here, see what you need to fill in. But um, I'm setting up, like I said, for the last section um, of this uh, chapter where we want to talk about kind of the going back and forth between El Nino um, condition, globally speaking, and a La Nina condition, globally speaking. And this actually, I wanted to start with focusing on a normal situation. And this is not normal, but I can make it normal without much trouble. <laughs> 
Because normally speaking, um, we generally have, and I talked about upwelling, we generally have upwelling, and this is focusing on, you see this is South America, and here's North America up here. Um, and as far as I can tell, um, El Nino and La Nina affects the globe, the entire Earth, but basically we kind of focus on this neck of the woods, and I think that this is called the Walker Cell. I think I've heard it referred to. And again, we're kind of looking at three dimensions. Here you see your converging um, easterly trades. This is the northeasterly trade and the southeasterly trade where your Hadley cells in each hemisphere uh, meet up. So this would be the ITZs, the intertropical convergence zone right here. And so um, forget about if we just take the strong off of here and just say trade winds, that's great. And if we take off the strong in front of equatorial um, uh, current, just put equatorial current, that's great. That's the normal conditions. Okay, actually, in a minute, you're going to see this is actually trying to show you La Nina event. But so we have our upwelling and we have happy, remember with upwelling, we have nutrients and relatively cool water. And so we have our happy uh, fishermen off here, uh, Peru, that sort of thing. So, um, uh, so we have North America, South America especially, because we focus on the Southern Hemisphere. And actually, La Nina and El Nino kind of goes back and forth, and it's called the, uh, the Southern Oscillation, because we kind of focus on this neck of the woods in the Southern Hemisphere. And I want to point out over here, oh, I don't know, I guess it's not marked in, but we have the Indonesian Islands, and we have the continent of Australia over here. Okay, so this is normal conditions. And um, like I said, kind of sometimes called the walker, walker cell, setting ourselves up for a condition that kind of oscillates back and forth, El Nino and La Nina.